Welcome to JJ, the JJ Dillon Podcast. I am your co-host, JP John Paz, and with me as always is the star of the show, two-time Hall of Famer, the leader of the legendary Four Horsemen, the second greatest manager of all time, former WWF and WCW executive, Mr. James J. Dillon. JJ, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing wonderful, and that, that introduction gets, uh, gets uh, uh, it's great. We're going to be joined a little bit later on by John Filippelli, and I met Flip when I was working for Vince McMahon in New York, and of course Flip was uh, president of the S Network. The S Network uh, televised the Yankee games and actually is the uh, majority ownership of the Yankees. And so I met Flip and his wife Jenna, and being in New York uh, area, living in Connecticut, had a chance to socialize with him and the beginning of a, of a great friendship, and he's going to join us a little bit uh, later on, which I'm very happy. And uh, it was a pleasant surprise a few weeks back to, to get a call out of the blue fun flip, and uh, he's uh, he's one of the good people. Yeah, what an honor. Whew, talk about you know your resume is great. Going into the baseball world and TV world, his resume is off the charts. I mean, whew. What a you know what a list of accomplishments for him. Not even just the Yes Network, just his whole career. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, for sure. And I also wanted to mention March twenty eighth. You'll be in the Berkeley Little League in Bayville, New Jersey, for TCW, making an appearance with Arn Anderson as well. So obviously, you know, you got a couple appearances coming up. That that should be good. It's always good to get back, back together with Arn and any of the four horse, but you and Arn especially. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the uh, the four horsemen thing is uh, something that's been an important part of my career, and uh, for people who have heard me talk about it, know how I feel that the 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 horseman thing is uh, something that comes along once in a lifetime with with uh, your career, whether it's wrestling, baseball, whatever it is, but it's certainly a, a part of mine, and. With Nature Boy Ric Flair, with uh, Tully Blanchard, and I, I really developed a particularly close friendship with Arn Anderson, Barry Windham. Uh, the Horseman deal is uh, is the real deal. And any time that we can get together, we all, you know, have gone our separate ways, live in uh, in, in separate areas, and uh, very very few times in 25 years uh, that we can all be together one place one time, and that's really a special occasion. But um, you know, even if it's uh, you know a one-on-one with with Barry or with Arn or with Tully or or with Rick, uh, it's always something that I you know greatly look look forward to. Can't miss one of those horsemen appearances. Getting them together, just uh, unbelievable. But kind of going back, and I was just thinking, just Terry Funk, and I was thinking of Amarillo, and I mean, obviously the the many retirements of Funk. But I just wanted to kind of touch on Amarillo. I remember early on we are talking about how that was definitely one of your favorite territories and, and the Funks. How did you end up in Amarillo, and what was your experience? I guess it was more with Dory Funk Sr. Well, actually, uh, I only met Dory Funk Sr. one time. Uh, it actually went back to my starting in the, in the, uh, as a full-time wrestler uh, in the Carolinas with Jim Crockett Sr., where I, I actually was there as a full-time wrestler for a period of just over two years. And I, as I said, that at the time, uh, Dory Funk Jr. was the reigning NWA world champion, which he held the title during that time for like a span of, uh, of, of four, about four full calendar years. But his, uh, his reign as champion uh, spanned a four-year period of time and got to know Jr. very well. And back then, this is before the Internet, before – cable television and uh, you know Amarillo always had the reputation of being a, a great territory because of the of the Funks and, and Senior and of course Eddie Graham actually was a performer in Amarillo and then went to Florida and kind of put down roots and uh, you know became uh, another uh, outstanding location in Florida so but the roots go back uh, for so many of the major names in wrestling to the Amarillo Territory. And when I was in the Carolinas and, and Dory came in 
uh, you know, and he had he, <laughs> you know, he made it clear to me. He said when I come in for a week or two weeks to defend the uh, the NWA title, you know, I like to see uh, who are the, the the wrestlers in in the territory, and uh, he said I I can't be I can't ever give the impression that I'm you know, recruiting for people to come to Amarillo. But he said, uh, if I see somebody that is really outstanding that's never been to Amarillo, it's hard for me if we ever have a, you know, a relaxed time and, and can talk about our careers and where we're going and what we're doing to not put in a plug for Amarillo, and which is what happened with me. And uh, the way it was presented to me was uh, whenever I left the Carolinas, that certainly the hope was that uh, Dory won't, said, I hope you'll come to Amarillo. And having watched me, having actually worked in the ring with me, uh, where I had challenged him uh, for several matches uh, uh, as uh, when he was the champion. And so he got to see firsthand experience in the ring of, of you know, what, what I was capable of doing and listened to my interviews and, you know, just told me, he said, uh, you should keep Amarillo in mind for wherever your travels take you. That he basically assured me that uh, that if I ever came to Amarillo, that I would be really well suited for the territory. That I was a uh, an Eastern boy from uh, New Jersey, and so uh, you know, a Yankee in Texas is uh, <laughs> it, it, it makes for an immediate talking point. So uh, I was. Uh, you know, I was humbled and flattered that uh, that Dory Funk Jr., the great world champion, you know, thought enough of, uh, of watching me to just plant the seed that he hoped that if the opportunity ever presented itself that I would consider going to, Am- uh, to Amarillo. And then during one of the, the big title matches that he had in Greensboro, um, Dory Funk Sr. and Terry Funk came in for that one show in a special tag match underneath Dory during the title defense. And Dory had me come down early to Greensboro and go by the hotel. And uh, it was my first opportunity to meet Terry. And my first opportunity and actually the only time that I ever met uh, Dory Funk Sr. And they, uh, you know, basically told me that uh, Dory had said so many positive things and they were uh, anxious to, to, you know, see me perform. And just based on the, the praise that was bestowed upon me by, by Dory Jr., that, uh, that I would consider coming, coming to Amarillo. And from there, uh, when that uh, season ended, I had been in the Carolinas for like a little over two years, and my next stopping point was up at the Canadian Maritimes, which is a, uh, a summer territory, and, when I went up there, I got a phone call, and uh, uh, Dory Funk Sr. had passed away in Amarillo. So it just was uh, one of those things that I look back and said I was so glad that I had a chance to meet him in person, spend a little time with him. And, uh, of course, the, my road for my career did take me to Amarillo and actually made like two or three different stops there where I went and stayed for a year and, um, it was just uh, it was a great territory um, uh, the late Dick Murdoch who to me was one of the greatest performers that that I had ever had the pleasure of being in the ring with competing with and uh, I have a very s- short list but Dick, Dick Murdoch was one as, uh, Leo Burke is another one and so I got a chance to go to Amarillo and th- at that time they were also um, the booking agent for All Japan Wrestling, the late Giant Baba. And so they, I was basically told that uh, coming to Amarillo, one of the bonuses would be an opportunity to go to Japan, which was on my bucket list, one of the things that I very much wanted to do. And my, I, when I finally went to Amarillo after I left the Carolinas and the Maritimes for that short stint, uh, I spent over uh, a little over a year and in the beginning, I uh, went to Japan for four weeks, and then before I finished up to go to uh, Florida, I, I went back and had another uh, uh, another tour of Japan, which is my uh, my really favorite place in the world to go of all my international destinations that I've been to. 
And I kind of just want to rewind one second because you talked about Dory Funk and NWA World Title matches. Do you know how many NWA World Title matches you actually ended up having? Uh, you know, I kept a record book, uh, really for tax purposes. Uh, so at the end of the year, uh, I could log. You know, you're you're as a professional wrestler, you're self-employed, and so um, you know the the mileage that you travel going to. Uh, bookings every day you know you're able to take the uh the, the mileage and if you have to stay over your lodging expense and and so like i say i kept the book just for when i would do my taxes at the end of the year so uh, i would have to go back and, and fortunately uh, uh there was there's a book called uh, a week at a glance and it was like when you open it up you'd have monday tuesday wednesday on the left side of the page and then thursday friday and then Saturday, Sunday would be split uh, on the other side of the page, and so I, I kept all those uh, books, thankfully, because it basically uh, was like a, um, um, a living diary of my career, and I, I would know where I went, and I would write the towns, and whatever mileage or other expenses, and I also wrote uh, if I wrestled you know, who my opponent was and what the outcome of the match was, and. So that way, I have an accurate record of of everything in my career. So I, I would have to go back and look, but um, I did did face story uh, uh, a number of times, and actually, the very first time was in uh, when I was in the Carolinas, and the the world champion never appeared on TV because he didn't need to. But they also like to have uh, uh, a match on tape so that it could be distributed to other territories prior to Dory coming in to defend the title. So I was approached by Johnny Weaver, and the Johnny had talked to uh, to Dory, and they, they said that they would like for me to do a match uh, on uh, the the, uh, the TV in Raleigh and have it recorded. And obviously, uh, you know, Dory was going to, uh, you know, established me to be able to hold my own with him and uh, you know it was like a 10 minute match and in the end uh you know dory took the fall right right in the middle of the ring and there was no shame uh, of being defeated by the the best in the business at that time the world champion which was dory funk and so the it was a very good competitive match and uh, they distributed that match to other territories prior to him coming, the Dory coming in to defend the title, but it also gave me some exposure and actually uh, enhanced my reputation. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't hurt losing to a great NBA world champion. And if you go back and you watch some of the tapes, like you, you, wherever you, you know, now you can get it from the internet, but back then it was tape trading and things like that when I was younger. And I watched Dory Funk and I was like, man, this guy is so good. I know everyone loves Terry Funk so much, and you know he's wacky and crazy. But if you go back, Dory Funk is such a good wrestler, even for so, somebody that was like a younger fan, like somebody me in my late thirties watching, you know, wrestling from the seventies or something like that. You know, where it's just a little bit out of my era. But you go back and watch him; it's like, man, he's an awesome wrestler. Like you just, you know, you fall in love with Dory Funk. You think, like, man, he's almost underrated to some of the fans today because of how good of a worker he was. Yeah, he, he was. He, he was. Uh... Uh, I have another w- former world champion that was a great in-ring performer was Pat O'Connor. And Dory, um, a lot of his things were uh, similar moves to, to what Pat O'Connor used. And uh, I, I'd also wrestled Pat O'Connor uh, as, a, as a world champion. So, you know, they like to say there's no shame if you if you if – you, uh, wrestle a world champion and lose, uh, you know, that's kind of a badge of, uh, of courage to be able to be worthy to challenge for the world title and to go in and, and all those champions knew how to um, establish your talent so that when they eventually went over, the, the, you know, they, it was a credible win for them. They beat somebody. So it was a win-win situation for me, and that's how – I I always looked at it, and it meant something, right? After the win, if they built you up a little more, it actually meant something for them to beat somebody who was somebody. Yeah, and and actually, uh, Johnny Weaver the first time uh, said to me that 
the world champion never appears on TV, but they like to have a, a TV match in, in the bank that other territories could use uh, if they wanted to uh, either show us a, a short match that uh, you know, showcased the, the champion's talent, which by the same token would also give me exposure in places that I probably would not be seen otherwise. So uh, I, I consider, you know, to lose to a world champion, if you can't lose to him, you know, you don't belong in the business. So uh, Dory uh, gave me a very, very competitive match, you know, won the fall in the, in the, right in the middle of the ring with a spinning toe hold. And uh, he, actually the, the, the week after that match on TV, uh, the, for the very first time was, I think, I want to say a 10-minute time limit match. And either the time ran out or something, and um, you know they had, they interviewed me on the Raleigh TV, and I said, "Wow, well, you know I, I, you know I had the butterflies and was uh, I admittedly intimidated being in the ring with the, the the best of our business, the NWA World Champion." And when the bell rang, uh, I realized very shortly that that I, uh, I mean, here's a guy that had the same as me has to put on his pants one leg at a time, and uh, kind of uh, the intimidation factor was lessened, and um, and the other thing was that uh, as a challenger, as a young guy in the business, you go in the ring against the world champion, you have nothing to lose. Uh, you go in there, and if 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 you if you lose the fall and get beat right in the middle of the ring, you've got beaten by the best. And if you're able to showcase your talent and have a competitive match. That increases your stock, and that's that's how I how I looked at it. So that match uh, that I had with Dory uh, went around to all the territories, and so that was part of uh, establishing my reputation as well. Who did you think was better? I mean, this may be like an impossible question because I know you wrestled them both a lot, but did you think Dory was better, or did you think Terry was better? Well, it, 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 the one thing is that there were two. Uh, very, very different style. I mean, they're brothers, but the, their styles were very, very, very different. Um, Dory was more of a ring technician, uh, very polished, uh, and I, I compare him, you know, I talk about Pat O'Connor being very, uh, very polished. And so that that's what I saw in Dory Funk. Terry Funk uh, was you know, off the wall, they talk about him being crazy. I mean, he was crazy, but crazy like a fox. And he was more, he, he was uh, bigger than uh, than Dory was, and a totally different style. He was very, very uh, aggressive, very physical. And, you know, if you didn't fight back, <laughs> Terry would basically physically beat you up. So it was, uh, it was a great match. Both times fighting for the world championship, but two very, very different styles of matches. And I, I enjoyed both. It's crazy to think, you know, when you think of those guys, how different they could be. But obviously so close in age. I think Dory's what, almost maybe just three years older than Terry. But it's just so much different. And, and the, the psychology is different. The style is different. You mentioned one's kind of crazy, one's off the wall, and one was such a great technician and known as being just a great worker. It is, when you think about it, right, it's a little crazy. One is, like, just nuts, and the other one is, it seems like, so calm and collected. And both of them uh, enjoyed great success as champions, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. And rightfully so. Now, you've wrestled uh, quite a few NWA champions, Harley Race as well. Actually, I never wrestled against Harley Race as a champion. I was a tag team partner with him uh, on many occasions uh, in Japan, uh, especially in Florida, but never actually uh, wrestled against Harley Race. Oh, you never uh, wrestled. wrestled? Wow, okay. I never wrestled. I wrestled Pat O'Connor. Um, I'd have to go back and, and of course, Dory. And, and so I've had a chance, to, and, and, and when Terry was a world champion as well, so I've I wrestled, you know, several world champions, and uh, uh, it's you know it's a great honor just to uh, um, to be chosen by a promotion that you're worthy of uh, having enough marquee value that fans will buy a ticket to see uh, a competitive match and feel that uh, 
you know, fans come with a world champion with a thought in mind that tonight might be the night when we see a, a, a title switch. And so you go in there, you prepare for it, and, you know, you go in there and, and give the, you know, your best effort and hopefully you have a credible match. And uh, the Funks, you know, like I say, two, both, not very many brothers tag team or uh, world champions mm-hmm. and two different, uh, very different styles, but both were very successful and very great uh, tag uh, world champions. What role did Dory Funk Sr. play in both of them being NWA world champion? Ah, uh, you know, I, I, I heard discussions. I, I was never uh, formally in a situation where there were political meetings, but uh, the National Wrestling Alliance obviously always wanted to have a champion that was going to 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 be uh, accepted by the fans as somebody who was a world champion that was uh, also box office, somebody that uh, was going to draw. And hopefully um, you're going to have a, a, a champion that can wrestle against guys with all different styles. Um, you know, talking about uh, Dory being very polished, Terry being more uh, aggressive and, uh, you know, more of a wild style, but um, they would go to different territories and have to wrestle the the top talent, top challenger in, in every territory that they went to. So it was uh, the, the champion that had to adapt to the style of whoever his uh, top challenger was as he would go from territory to territory. And Terry was able to do it. Dory was able to do it, even though they had uh, drastically you know, different styles uh, individually. And now we take you to our interview with one of the most influential and respected executives in all of sports television. He is the president of production and programming for the Yes Network, the legendary John J. Filippelli. Hey, JJ. Flip, how are you, my friend? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing great. Hope you and Jenna are having a joyous holiday season. We really are, and uh, we just had our first grandchild, so it's oh, most exciting. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. We had a girl. Uh, the, my, well, Johnny had my oldest son, Johnny, had, and his wife, they had a baby girl, so you know, it's pretty exciting, you know. Mother and child both doing well? Yeah, everybody's great, and um, uh, it's just it's special, and it's, uh, yeah, I'm enjoying it. We're really much, very much enjoying it, and it's, uh, uh, so between that, it, she, she was born... Uh, Five minutes before we signed Garrett Cole. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I said to my wife, I said, it doesn't get any better than this. And she said, what are your priorities here? I said, hmm. well, the baby, of course. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. What a, what a great way to, uh, to end the year. And uh, I'm happy for you. Uh, you know, you, you meet all kinds of people. And I'm sure, you know, you uh, being in New York and, and being around Vince McMahon had a chance to uh, uh, to meet a number of people from the wrestling world. And just like the baseball world, you have all kinds of uh, characters and personalities, and and the wrestling business is, is, is no different. But it was uh, one of the things that for the time that I lived in Connecticut working for Vince McMahon that I had a chance to uh, – uh, you know, to meet you and Jenna and, and uh, attend some social functions and, uh, uh, you know, just uh, happy that uh, I can call you my friend. Oh, I'm, listen, you're one of the best people I've known, not just from wrestling, but I've met in, in my uh, 47, 40, like 47 or 48, I forget how many years it is now, 47 or 48 years I've been in the business of doing whatever it is that I do. And, uh, I've been very fortunate to meet great people and a lot of great people, and you were certainly uh, right near the top, JJ. You're one of the nicest people I know and a good guy and just always treated everyone with decency and respect. And, uh, you know, uh, I think a lot of people could have learned lessons from you. Well, I greatly appreciate it, and especially uh, uh, very, very, uh, very wonderful words, especially coming from you. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, 
once the weather turns warm and uh, the season starts, uh, I'm going to take you up on that offer for you and I to hook up and uh, and uh, enjoy a game together. Uh, by all means, I would. I love that. We'd have we'll have a great time, and uh, I'll show you around. And uh, so we when we I went to we had a press conference for Garrett Cole the other day, and we were televising it on Yes. And so I was waiting for him after he was on the dais and they, they did the introductions and he was talking to the overall remarks to the press. He was going to come over to talk, spend some time with us. So I was waiting for him to come over. And uh, uh, first Hal got on, Hal Steinbrenner. He was on. We, we broke it up where, like, uh, two of our people were doing Hal, working on Hal. And then when we were done with Hal, on the other side of the room, we had two more of our people and they were going to interview Cole. So I was standing with the group that was going to interview Cole. So I was, we were just waiting for Hal to finish. So I wound up in a conversation with him, and I said, asked him where he was staying. And I said, where are you staying? And he names the hotel he's staying at, and it was the very nice hotel in New York. And, and, and I said, oh, I said uh, that's a nice hotel. And he looked at me, and he goes, it's very pricey. And I went, really? Really? Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. He just got a million dollars to start, J.J., yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> so it comes out to about it's it's actually it's actually a, a little let's see it's a little more than a million dollars a start and oh and wow but, so I had I just he, found that funny I said yeah he I sounds like he, by that story I thought he's very grounded and not uh, you know you hope that uh, that somebody that uh, that reaches the pinnacle like that and uh, is rewarded with the success that they deserve. Uh, is also smart enough to know that uh, my father always used to say, do everything in moderation. You know, enjoy your success, but when it comes to to money, you know, you 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 need to. You don't want to hoard it all. You want to spend some and enjoy your success, but you also want to save something. Do everything in moderation, and that was always a uh, a lesson that I that I always had in the back of my mind. Well, I was told by my family, which that most of them were in prison told me, spend it all. Because if you don't spend it, your kids will. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, they're, those are words to live. They're good words. They're, they're, they're good. You know, listen, that's good advice. And I would just tell my kids just to uh, treat people the way you want to be treated and, uh, you know, enjoy your life. And, uh, you know, but remember that uh, you have a responsibility if you feel fortunate enough to, to, be, to, to, you know, have some money or have some resources that, you have responsibility to give something back. And uh, so we got involved with Make-A-Wish because of Pierce's illness. My son, nearly, uh, my youngest son, Pierce, nearly, he was nearly, uh, nearly passed away from uh, cancer. And we were fortunate that he, he was able to battle through and, and he's fine now. But it was really touch and go. So we got involved with Make-A-Wish. And uh, so we do that every – we've been on the board between – Jenna and I, we've been on the board for the last um, – let's see, this was 19 – it was 1904, 1904, right? 2000 for 1904, really. It was 2004, so we're enough. So it was uh, for four. Let me let me do the math here, JJ. Four from 19 is uh, so it's 15 years ago, and so we've been on involved with Make a Wish for 15 years between the two of us taking turns on the board and doing the fundraiser in Greenwich. I mean, you should come to the fundraiser in Greenwich, JJ. You could be my guest. It's a great cause, and we have we have I have a lot of. I'm fortunate enough to use the resources of yes, and that I know a lot of people in the ball plays the Yankees. We get a lot of people, players, and people to come. And it's been raises. We raised uh, this year. We raised net net when all was said and done. We raised eight million dollars. Oh, that's During, wonderful. You know, so that, that's you know that's that's a good fundraiser, and it's, we do it once a year. And but you know we try to do things like that, and just because you know what the, it's, it's the right thing to do, and we should do it. And it's a great cause, and you know you really realize that you're very fortunate if you. Especially those of us who've had kids, and you've had kids, so you know that by the grace of God, go any of us. So it's 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 quite humbling and quite scary, but it's also uh, you know it's quite rewarding when you know you can just try to do something for other people. It just means a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I have one son who was a twin, and um, we almost lost him at birth. Uh, yeah, he, he has cerebral palsy, but uh, cognitively, uh, he's uh, you know did not affect that, and he. He and his sister, uh, twin sister, both graduated from the University of Delaware. Took uh, Jeffrey uh, an extra year, but uh, he's uh, he's been uh, you know he's been my hero because he uh, had a weakness on the left side. He's uh, been in a walker, and once he started school, he was in a power wheelchair, 
in order to get uh, from class to class without uh, you know being injured and and uh, I never one day in his life have I ever had him say to me you know why me you know why why was the you know why was I afflicted like this but uh, and so that's why he's my hero I, I, wow that's a great story I'm, I'm, well, that's amazing and good for him to 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 feel that way because it's very easy to feel it will be and it's understandable sometimes we all feel sorry for ourselves and for ver- over various things at various times but it's uh, that is that is that's amazing and I might tip my hat to him and uh, and all if right. you want to take him with you to uh, be do a game he'd be my honor to have him to come too well, so I, I greatly appreciate that he's uh, he's a, I, I I had the uh, one daughter by my first marriage who has given me grand grandchildren and great grandchildren, and uh, she lives up in Reading, Pennsylvania, and I, I get to see her. Uh, and of course, with my I didn't have any children with my second marriage. She she already had children, which uh, I I helped raise, and then uh, got married again for the third time, and that's when uh, I had twins and. Um, and then one other girl that came along three three years later, and she's now just starting her second year of law school at uh, Mercer Law School in Macon. So, uh, then JJ, I, were you I, like were you nine when you got married? For a second? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is like uh, I mean, well, you lived, you must have lived in Arkansas. You worked for like uh, no, I, I, I mean, uh, I guess it's Texas, but uh, you must have worked for one of those regional guys. I mean, you must have been nine or ten when you got married. Uh, I got married Wait, the first time. Children? I got married the first time uh, a month after I graduated from college. I went to Albright College in Reading, Pennsylvania, and Pam came into the world. And uh, I was, uh, admittedly, at that point, uh, immature, not ready for uh, the responsibility of marriage. The blessing was that we had a daughter, Pam, that uh, is now uh, giving me uh, grandchildren and great grandchildren, and so. That marriage was worth it from the standpoint of, uh, you know, bringing my daughter in the world. And then uh, I married uh, the second time a woman that was uh, five years older than me that had th- uh, three sons, and I raised them. We didn't have any children together. And then, uh, you know, life is uh, life is strange. I uh, fell in love with uh, a woman when I was working with uh, with Crockett, and uh, she was uh, in charge of travel and. You know, one thing goes to another, and we ended up getting married. We were married for 14 years and had the twins. Is that Lindsay? Was that Lindsay? Was that Lindsay? Yeah, it was Lindsay, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I knew. That's the woman that I knew. I knew, I knew you yeah. when uh, you were married to Lindsay. So it's, uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure you feel the same way, that we, uh, you know, as we get older, we, uh, you know, we live, we live our life through uh, through our children. And, uh my parents always took good care of me, and I, I wasn't smart enough to work as hard as I should have uh, getting grades uh, in uh, in high school. And so my father and, and my mother uh, both worked in order for me to get a college education, and uh, I now realize, uh, you know, how stupid I was that didn't appreciate what they did, did for me. And but I, uh, you know, I I wanted to I wanted to do for my children as well as uh, as what my parents did for me, and uh, and I'm 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 sure I'm not alone. Everybody, uh, um, you know, if you had kids, I think in most cases you live your life uh, through your through your children, and you want them to have everything that you had and and more. Well, you, I know, I know this. You've lived your life with honor and integrity, and there's a lot to be said for that. And I, you know, I, uh, I know a lot of, you know, what a metric is. Uh, people who are very successful by the metric of money, or, or but they're, I wouldn't consider them successful because they're just not great people to be around. And just because you make money doesn't make you successful. It doesn't make give you the right to to treat people in the manner in which uh, you think is fit, but isn't really proper. And I, uh, you know, those who, I mean, I've worked for some very, very interesting people, uh, as you have, I'm sure. I mean, I know some of the people you've worked for. I know some people I've worked for, and, you know, uh, and believe it or not, one of the better people I ever worked for was George Steinbrenner. 
uh, believe, uh, and a lot of people don't like Mr. Steinberg and like him for a variety of reasons, but I really liked him, and he was great to me. And uh, when Pierce was sick, there was nobody better. So I must tell you, um, you know, you hear a lot of stories about a lot of people, and, you know, the, George certainly had his moods, and I mean, I've got stories. I could write 48 books, uh, which I would never write one. But I must tell you, when push came to shove, he was he was there when it mattered, and he was really a good soul. He just was a, he was just you know he was obsessed with winning, and because his father was a perfectionist, and you know, and it drove him mad. I mean, to him, there was no such thing. The expression is, uh, you don't win the silver, you lose the gold. You know, and that was one of the expressions he used to use all the time. It was like, you know, second place wasn't good enough; you had to win because his father was a perfectionist and drove him. And yet his mother was so beneficent. She was so sweet and kind that his kindness, and he had incredible kindness, came from the mother. So I got to see these both sides of this guy every day, literally for years. And I worked very close with him because we had to start the network and work on the network together. And, you know, and then I could tell you we'd have arguments and disagreements, and he'd yell at me and I'd yell at him. But, you know, what? when we were done, we were there was a respect that we had for one another, and that was great. And, you know, I, I did never really suffered fools well. Um, you know, people who were didn't treat other people well were difficult. Uh, you know, I have a lot of respect. Well, you know, it, it sounds corny, but, you know, we talk about the golden rule, and I have always tried to uh, subscribe to that because if if you lead your life where you always try your best to treat people the way you want to be treated, uh, if, if, you, if you subscribe to that, um, Basically, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be okay. You you can never go through uh, a lifetime, whether it's the wrestling business, whether it's the baseball world, and not have people along the way who sometimes, uh, rightfully so maybe, uh, without you even realizing it, or sometimes uh, you get a bad rap on just where people, you know, have bad feelings about whatever. But I always, uh, uh, like you said, George Steinbrenner, you know, treated you well, and I've always tried to judge people on my not not the reputation or what I heard about them or what somebody else said about them. I always never prejudged anybody and made my uh, judgment based on my my individual experience. And uh, they treated me well. I mean, how can you say something bad about somebody that, that did treat you well? I, and you know, whatever happened with somebody else, that's that's their business in a different. Uh, right different situation well it still doesn't change my opinion of bruce pritchett <laughs> <laughs> so there you go jj oh <laughs> what can i say well we've got off on a tangent and flip it's uh it's been great to uh to, to have some time with you and i hope you and jenna uh have a wonderful holiday season uh, you got a grandchild that's uh that's a wonderful blessing and uh hopefully the 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 it's now. It's not a nineteen. It's a twenty. And, yeah, uh, it's true. a new uh, new decade, and and hopefully the years ahead will will treat you uh, treat you kindly. And I'm and I'm going to hold you to the to the thing when a baseball season opens. Oh, uh, absolutely. Hook up with you and, and go to enjoy a game with you. And JJ, anytime. Just just give me. Just let me know you're coming, and I will. Uh, I'll take care of everything. I greatly appreciate it, Mister Filippelli. Before you go, I just yes, wanted to. Are make we done sure at I... the end of the show? I just wanted to make sure. Uh, I just wanted to ask you um, about how did you actually meet JJ? Like I know, obviously working in Connecticut, stuff, but how did yeah. that relationship start? How did that friendship start? Um, I was reading the Bible and I read about the four horsemen, and I was confused <laughs> because I saw JJ. So wait a minute, this does not look like the picture of the Bible. So no, I, 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 how did I meet JJ? I met him through. Uh, we were working at the WWF together. I met him through. Uh, uh, working at the WWF, he was. Uh, we were there at the same time, and uh, I, uh, I really, I mean, I had known him. I mean, I, had, uh, I was a, a wrestling fan, so I had known, you know, I know obviously knew JJ and I knew his work, but I didn't know him personally. But that's where I got a chance to know him, and uh, you know, I, I, I liked him a great deal. He was very easy to like. He's a, it was a professional. He treated everybody with with kindness, and he had a lot of integrity. And, um, you know, and he didn't treat, uh, I was an outsider when, because the, the way the wrestling business is, you, you probably know this, or certainly JJ could sort of, it's tough when you're not in the business to work in the business if you didn't come from the business. I didn't come from the business. I came from the world of, of television sports. 
and um, you were, you know, that's where I made my name and my reputation. And I was principally a baseball person, baseball producer. I had produced, uh, by the time I got to WWF, I had produced seven World Series, a um, couple of Super Bowls, a couple of Olympics. I mean, I'd done a lot of sports television and, and you know, and it, but it was, I thought it was time to take a little break. Uh, uh, NBC lost its baseball contract and, uh, I had a chance to, I knew the McMahons because they lived in Greenwich. And I also lived in Greenwich. And I, I had worked on the Rock and Wrestling Connection special that they had done in the, in the mid-'80s. Actually, I had suggested it to NBC that we do this special because it's Cindy Lauper and, and it, was, it was going mainstream and people were really, you know, uh, who were not wrestling fans were enjoying wrestling through the Rock and Wrestling Connection. So I saw that and I pitched NBC on the idea of doing special. And I I convinced Bob Costas to be in the special with me. I was his producer. I produced Bob for like nine or ten years. And uh, so I brought – so I got Bob to do the special, and I produced it. And that's where I got a chance to really work with the McMahons again and, you know, meet all the wrestlers. And that's where I met, you know, the the Pipers and the Hogans and and, and, and the various other stars at the time. And uh, and, – and so when I was looking for something else to do, NBC lost the baseball contract, and I figured, well, I, I can't go to CBS because it's just not going to work there. So I, I said, where, what can I do for a little bit of time until I can figure out what I want to do? And I said, you know what? Uh, Vince called me, and he said, listen, would you like to come and be the EP here, the executive producer here? And I thought it would be – he pitched me. I, mean, I, I said, I don't, I don't really know that much about wrestling. I mean, I, it's one thing to do a, work on a special and have fun. And in terms of the business, I don't know the business. He said to me, but you know television. And I said, well, yeah. And he said to me, well, teach us television. And I said, okay. I said, I, I, I could do that. And so I, I, when, I, when I started, uh, I signed up to, to this two years. And, um, you know, it was an interesting experience. I, I look back on it all, and uh, I don't regret it. I really don't. I mean, it didn't really work really well for me because I, I, a lot of people were – let's just say being difficult in the sense that they were protecting the business and they didn't trust me to protect the business. I mean, I, it was, it was a, very much a kayfabe kind of thing. And at the time, and you know, I, it's changed now because what, what's happened now, and I know Michelle Wilson and a lot of other people were at the WWE now. I, I know a lot of them and, and they've been able to separate the business professionals from the wrestling, from the wrestling side. So you've got the business side and you've got the wrestling side and they're not necessarily joined together anymore. Back then, it was you were part of it, and it was very hard for me to get past um, the sort of the, the people getting to know me or trust me because I was an outsider. And it's always been the case. It was the case for many, many years. If you didn't come from that business, it, it was very hard for the people in it to sort of trust and take to people who came from the outside. It wasn't always uh, – it was just difficult. It wasn't that it couldn't be done. It was just was difficult. So I, I had a really difficult time, and I uh, – I've always was a person that spoke my mind, so you know I found uh, uh, Vince to be brilliant at what he did. I would never say Vince McMahon is not brilliant. He's brilliant at what he did. He's the greatest marketer that I've ever met, and he taught me a lot about marketing. I learned so many things from Vince, but one of the things that, that I didn't learn was I also learned that the 10 o'clock in the morning meeting takes place at 5 in the afternoon, which is you know <laughs> a little difficult um, to, to get work done, and there were a lot of things about it that just were, were, were sort of difficult for me. So, um, so when the two years was up, it was just better that we, we went our separate ways and I went back to the, to, you know, the, the world that I knew and, and uh, he was able to move on to people who were better suited to do what he needed done. Although I must tell you, there were a lot of people I brought in like Dave Zahadi and people like that who knew, who gave them their look and their feel and developed things for them that, uh, that they wouldn't have had if had I not been involved. So I, I I managed to get a lot of people involved in it who actually did pretty well and were with the McMahons for a long time. So I feel like my contributions there were they worked there. I did make some contributions, although I must tell you it was uh, at times it was frustrating and you know and uh, not everybody was uh, JJ Dillon or Jack oh, Lanza okay. or, or uh, Bobby Heenan. They were all those who were my some of my three favorite people. Well, I I. Uh... You know, I appreciate that, and you know, I've always felt that uh, at different times in your life, you're you, you're dealt a hand, and I've always learned rather than than complain about the hand that you're dealt, to make the best of it and try to see the, yes. the, the good in people. And as you've said, uh, with all your experiences, uh, you know, you've you've learned uh, rather than looking at it as being a two-year black mark in your in your resume of your career, I mean, it was two years that 
that you did some things that the wrestling business is, is better for. And I always try to do the same thing, uh, judge people for what they have to offer. And, um, and uh, I'm glad that I had the opportunity to work with you for those two years. And, uh, and Flip, I'm uh, proud to call you a friend. Well, same here. Uh, obviously, I'm very proud to call you a friend. And I've, uh, I've uh, even when at times when we little we lost touch, it wasn't for it just that you know life just took me down a different road. It wasn't that you don't know, think about people because even people that to this day that I met in various parts of my life that I I wound up not seeing for many years or maybe never seeing again, there they the mark that they left on me, the imprint they left on me, uh, was one of. Then I, you know, I, I, they were, I, I just funny how you just think of people at the weirdest times and in the oddest set of circumstances. But um, there are people that I look back on and I say, you know, I'm really glad that I knew them because they made me better. They made me better at what I did professionally, or they made me better, a better person. And you know, I think the most important thing is not so much make you a better professional, although I think that's important. I think that somebody can make you a better person and you can learn from them. And uh, I've met a lot of great people along the way, whatever I've done, been able to work on in my life. And I've been the most fortunate that a lot of people you know, I've stayed in touch with through the years. But even the ones that I've lost touch with, it doesn't mean that they didn't matter to me. They, they matter to me just that life just took us down different roads. And I often wonder about them and I wish them well. And uh, I'm really glad that J.J. had a chance to, to sort of reconnect because uh, I always thought the world of you and I always conducted yourself with the most class and the most – you know, and just the professionalism. I mean, it's really important to be a professional to me. That's always been the bottom of my years, like when I wasn't uh, seeing eye to eye with Vince about certain things. I mean, I always try to conduct myself like a professional. And, um, you know, because that always mattered to me. It was I want people to look at me and say, well, you know, you don't always have to agree with me, but I would always insist that people I would like their respect. Their respect matters to me. I want to respect people and I want them to respect me. And I think if, if you go about your life, I've always taught my boys that, you know, that it's important to show respect for people and you respect people, and that, but you have to earn respect. You know, respect isn't given. You have to earn respect. So once you earn that respect, um, you, you know, that you, you've done a lot and that you expect people have to earn your trust too. It's about trust and respect. If you could do that and you and could say that people trust and respect you and, and, and vice versa, I think you've said a lot. So, I'm, and I felt that way about you. You were just the most well, I, easiest I person to respect. And, uh, I enjoyed uh, and. Each step of, along the, the journey of my career, uh, I've met some wonderful people. And of course, I count you among them and, and, and learn from them because you came from a different world. Uh, you're a television guy. Baseball was mainly your thing. And I, I love baseball as a fan. And during the two years, uh, I, I learned a lot from you and, and felt that uh, that was uh, a good experience for me. And, and just listening to you, it sounds like it was uh, – you know, that's the hand that you were dealt for two years and you made the best of it. And, um, you know, you're now back uh, in what you love to do best and at the top of your game, and I'm happy for you. And now your biggest challenge comes being a grandpa. You know what, that's not, that's, you know, and I look at that and I go, if that's the biggest challenge I've got, then you know what, I've been very blessed because that's, this is such a privilege and such, so much fun. And I, and I don't have any idea what I'm doing yet. I, I don't know that I'll ever will, but I, I do know that uh, it, now I could just spoil them, spoil it to death and, and I give it back to, to my, my son and my daughter and they could raise it, but I could, I just get to spoil it and have fun and they get to raise it. I, I, I love that part of it. Well, I'm, I'm happy for you, and I wish you all the best uh, professionally and, and, of course, in your personal life as we go into uh, into a new year and, and look forward to uh, uh, hooking up with you and catching a ball game once the season starts. Same here, J.J. Well, we got off on a different tangent, but uh, it was time well spent with, uh, you know, in your journey you meet people along the way that uh, you can't anticipate what that experience is going to be, but... Uh, you know, working for Vince McMahon, uh, the circle of people that that uh, he worked with, with uh, all the different projects that he was doing, uh, it was uh, a good time for me. And and one of the positive things was, uh, you know, meeting uh, Flip and and uh, developing a relationship with him. And like I say, you know, we all go our separate ways. And even though, because uh, people that know me know that I am an extremely private person. I'm not someone who who gets on the phone and chit-chats, and it's not because I, I don't care. It's just that I, <laughs> I'm an incredibly private person. And But yeah, I value the friendships that I've made along the way, and and, uh, and John Filippelli is uh, right up there near the top. 
awesome to get him on. What, what a resume, what a career for him in sports in general. But those two years as the executive producer of WWF TV, what was, and a guy we never even talked about on the show as of yet, which is shocking, but what was Kevin Dunn's role at, at the time that Flip was there? Was he just kind of just a producer or where was he kind of stationed? Yeah, he's God. Kevin's been there forever. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. uh, and is uh, very good at what he what he does, and uh, you know what happens. It's like with, with Pat Patterson, uh, Vince McMahon, you know, has built the, a, a global brand. Uh, I don't think there's anybody else in the world because wrestling is truly a, a worldwide phenomena, and you know he's built a global brand, and he's had quality people along the way, and people like Kevin Dunn and Pat Patterson and. And I was uh, happy to, you know, to to be there. Uh, well, I guess almost eight years, and uh, you know, met met a lot of quality people along the way, Flip being among them. So, uh, I, on my journey along the way, I, I look at uh, that I was always fortunate to be around good people and and develop something of, of value from that experience, and and that, that it was part of the, the my learning curve. What was your thoughts on Kevin, uh, Kevin Dunn? Were you friendly with him? Was he kind of um, maybe not as, as high up on the, pe- the pecking scale or whatever you want to call it on, on the pecking order? What was your relationship like with him? Well, it, uh, it, was, it was something that uh, I was always on the creative side, and uh, he was on the technical side. And so not that the – I mean, they're, they're both uh, – important cogs in the wheel of success but it's something that uh that i never worked with closely with kevin just because of my responsibilities were um you know a, a different part of uh what was going on now he's been, I think... there. he's been there the i always say the toughest test i don't care where you go or what you do is the test of time and kevin dunn has been there a long time because he is the absolute best at what he does I was going to say, now do you think that he's maybe been there the longest of anybody? I'm trying to think. Cause obviously, Fink is kind of health reasons isn't around any longer. But could Kevin Dunn maybe? Is he the longest lasting employee? You know, it could be as far as I know. Like I say, Howard was the first employee. Mm-hmm. Uh, and But Kevin Dunn was uh, there early on. And, and like I say, he was uh, he was so good at what he did. And, and Vince has always been smart of surrounding himself with people that whatever their their specific role is, that he uh, he always tries to get the the, the best people of what they do and, and to hold on to them. And what was your relationship with like with uh, Howard Finkel? Because now that I just think about it, we've never really mentioned him either. And like you said, he was Vince, really technically his first employee. Obviously, now he's got some health issues and some health problems. Uh, he made a brief appearance backstage at one of the shows recently, uh, but he was in a wheelchair. So have you heard from Fink? Do you talk to Fink? Were you friendly at all with him? Um, I, 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 I talk about having a lot of uh, relationships, a business relationship with people. And as I've said, uh, I, I'm a very, very private person. And as such, um, you know, I, I'm not someone who, who – picks up the phone and, you know, it gets to be this time of year. Um, you know, uh, I'll call a Terry Funk, somebody who has uh, been a friend and, and somebody that I'm close to and worked the Amarillo Territory, went to Japan with him and became a friend. And uh, But by and large, uh, you know, I, I don't uh, – Terry Funk would be one. Kevin Sullivan is another one, and I don't – I'm sure over the holidays I'll either get a call from Kevin or I'll call him. And like I say, Leo Burke, because I got my break up in the Canadian Maritimes. But it's a, it's a small circle of people, and I I don't know. I can't explain it. It's 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 just something that uh, I'm not one to pick up the phone and and to call unless I have something in particular. Uh, not to just you know call and say hello and pass the time, and it's not because I don't care because I do. Kevin Sullivan and you, 
not to say that he's not a really bright or smart guy or anything, but just thinking of you and him, it doesn't mesh together. You know what I mean? Like he's the devil worshiper. You're the, you know, the dress in the suit. You know what I mean? It's like, how, how are those two, really, you know, good friends? It's just funny to think about it. Well, it was kind of like with Dusty. Uh, Dusty and, and Kevin Sullivan was this way too, or, or what, I, what I classify as, as big picture guys. They would see the big picture. And they always had, they were always thinking big. And, and I was a, a detail person. And I would, would you know, they, Dusty or Kevin would come up with, uh, with, a, with a, uh, you know, a, a plan of, of going uh, in a certain direction. And then I would then follow alongside and take, take whatever that idea was and fill in the gaps and take care of the details. And so... I, I and I would would be the first to admit that I could never have duplicated or done what Dusty Rhodes did, what Kevin Sullivan did. Uh, they they are so good at that big picture thing, but I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm proud to say that I don't know of anybody that's any better than I am at then taking uh, the, the the plan as as they lay it out there with the big picture and then fine-tuning it and and taking care of the details and so we we work in we work in harmony harmony and i always feel that they've got the big idea and then i come along and fill in some of the pieces and between the two of us the uh, uh you know can take take that big idea and have it be uh, the most successful that it possibly can be and i think that is an Absolutely perfect stopping point for this week's episode. 